Welcome to SVG TV's news for Wednesday, June 16, 2021. I'm Triska Campbell with the details. The three main unions representing the public sector workers here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines are standing together on the position that until Prime Minister Gonzalez presents them the government's policy on vaccination and testing, which they say was promised in the last meeting they had with him in April, they will not encourage their members to comply with the request for them to get tested every two weeks for COVID-19. A memorandum dated June 11, 2021, from the Permanent Secretary and the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment to heads of programs and units stated that as of Monday, June 14, all employees of the state who have not been vaccinated against COVID-19 are required to get tested regularly for the infection. The memorandum noted that the unvaccinated employees will be required to be tested up to once every two weeks based on risk levels, as determined by the Ministry of Health authorities in keeping with the directive from Cabinet. President of the SVG Teachers Union, Oswald Robinson, told SVG TV News in a telephone interview that if there are cases of COVID-19 at any educational institution, it is understood that the relevant authorities will conduct uh, contact tracing and persons in this case will subject themselves to be tested however noted it must be voluntary must be voluntarily so we be, have been saying to our members hold your ground stand with your union do not make anybody in authority force you or intimidate you in terms of mandatory testing or mandatory vaccination so the position of the teachers' union, we are resolute and we will do all that is necessary within the confines of the law and based on trade union exercises to defend the rights of our members. Robertson said it is all good that the government has sent out a memo through the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment outlining its policy, but in his view, there is no clear policy on that. But him speaking about the common law, but the common, there is no common law that must supersede the constitution. And the constitution of our land is the supreme law of the land. And in the constitution you have your fundamental rights, rights to freedom of conscience. So if you want to tamper with that fundamental right, right to freedom of conscience, then that's where the trouble begins. The position of the teachers' union remains. Our membership took a decision in April that there must be no mandatory testing, no mandatory vaccination, and that is the position of the teachers' union. I have a responsibility as the president to uphold the decision of the membership and to reaffirm that position. The SVG Teachers Union president said members should not be intimidated by what they are hearing because there is no law that can terminate them or for not complying with a vaccination or testing request. I heard the Prime Minister talking about misconduct. When we look at the regulation, misconduct does not apply to you exercising your freedom of conscience. In fact, the state is violating your right. So there is no law that says that you must be fired because you refuse to take an, a substance into your body which does not have the approval from reputable sources. It, it is clearly nonsense on behalf of the employer. This is another um, attempt to intimidate people to go against their conscience. I have already informed the Caribbean Union of Teachers and all the member units who would stand with us in defending our fundamental rights and freedom. We have already spoken to Education International, the Caribbean Teachers Federation, based in Canada, and we are prepared to go all the way to the International Labour Organization to ensure that our fundamental right to conscience is not taken away from us, because that is what the state is trying to do. Meanwhile, President of the Police Welfare Association, Sergeant Brenton Smith, said their members will not be intimidated or forced to take the COVID-19 vaccine. 
Sergeant Smith told SVGTV News via a telephone interview that the police welfare stands firm with the teachers and public service unions in the position not to comply with the regular testing until the promised documents are presented to them by the cabinet. I'm still saying here today that we stand from a welfare executive standpoint on our previous view of no one, regardless of who they are, will prevent or stop or force any of our members to be vaccinated. We maintain that this is a choice for our members based on if they have read along the topic of the vaccination and after consultation with the medical practitioner. Who for years have been advising them they are not ensure to take a vaccine or advise them generally by a medical group. How will this hurt to be that our medical practitioner can advise us as to whether we should take the vaccine or not? The Police Welfare Association president questioned what will happen after the testing and whether workers in the country no longer have freedom of choice, consent, and conscience, which is stated in the Constitution. I think we don't have a constitution in them side. But until we have the constitution still, we will abide them by that. It is the supreme law of our land. I remember vividly that when I asked question to members of the cabinet you know, as to whether or not this has been forced upon force, the Minister of Finance indicated no, that this has been done once in every two weeks, something like that, that eventually courses will be forced to basically be inclined to be vaccinated. So if that is the purpose of the of the testing, I have a I have difficulty with that as well. Because it's not for the core purpose of testing to see whether or not your members has COVID. But rather so that person eventually will, will, will give in and to be vaccinated. That could ever be right. The Public Service Union is also in full support of the position of the SVG Teachers Union and the Police Welfare Association. The PSU President Elroy Boucher told SVG TV News yesterday that public servants who wish not to comply with the requirements of regular testing for COVID-19 can sign a legal document with the Public Service Union which they can provide to their superv supervisors on why they are not giving consent to be tested. Prime Minister Dr. Abdan Savs has raised the issue of a recognition of non-approved vaccines as a viable COVID-19 jab, as many countries around the world, including the OECS and the wider Caribbean region, race to vaccinate their populations while facing limited availability of WHO-approved vaccines. Addressing the fifth sitting of the OECS Assembly held virtually today, Prime Minister Gonzalez said he has taken the Sputnik vaccine but is unsure of whether other countries may accept it. While asking for the WHO to possibly provide some advice in this regard. Dr. Gonzalez was responding in part to an address by guest speaker, Director General of the WHO, Dr. Tedros Gibreyes. The other vaccines, which are not yet approved by WHO, like for instance, the Sputnik. I don't know what is this, the status, the, the, the current status, where that approval process is going. But I read that about 70 countries in the world, covering 40 or close to 50% of the world's population, including India, where this Sputnik has been put out for emergency um, uh, rollout. The issue arises, what does the WHO advise, or if they have any advice at all, for countries which even they may not roll out Sputnik for their populations or their residents, whether they would recognize it for purposes of migration. For example, I have taken the Sputnik, but we got limited quantities, about 800 or so to a particular source. But I don't know if I can go to St. Kitts and be considered to be vaccinated. 
Prime Minister Gonzales also spoke on the difficulties facing the region's vaccination uptake, saying that while the information and technology can play a critical role in getting more persons vaccinated, the countries are facing what is termed uh, what he termed sorry as an infodemic, as also pointed out by Saint Lucia's Foreign Affairs Minister. I have to accept also, which is of great relevance. And I want to put it on the table for the engagement, which we know exists, is what we have currently, globally, in addition to having a network pandemic, we have an infodemic. A lot of fake news on, on, um, on, on the internet and social media, a lot of anti-vax talk, making it very difficult for some countries, in fact, for lots of countries or particular populations in particular countries to have the rollout of the vaccine in a manner which is optimal. In fact, in many respects, um, we have a suboptimal rollout and this is why we have to begin to look at uh, a number of issues touching and concerning um, uh, the, the, the incentives. Also addressing the fifth sitting of the OECS Assembly was opposition leader Dr. Garvin Friday, who proposed a robust documentation process that can help to pinpoint areas of strengths and weaknesses in the mission towards the OECS integration. What I want to suggest, Madam Speaker, is that one of the functions, and I'm glad that the, 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 the Honorable Member from Antigua mentioned it, for making this assembly the work of the assembly, an essential part of the work of the OECS integration movement and giving it real substantive work to be done, if not at both of the sessions that ought to be held each year, but at least periodically, once a year, twice, uh, once every two years, but that we prepare a report for the assembly. One that says, this is where we are along this road to integration or um, what is political economic cooperation, how far have we come in achieving these objectives? And make this a document of this assembly and present it to the assembly, whether it's annually, and it becomes now a basis for substantive debate within this assembly as to how far we have come and where we need to go, where the stumbling blocks are, so we can see that we're making measurable progress. The fifth sitting of the OECS Assembly saw the coming together of the OECS heads of government, representatives from the parliament of each full member state and the legislature of each associated member state, along with members of the opposition. Special guest speakers were Dr. Terroros Gibreyes, Director General of the WHO and Acting Director of the Western Hemisphere Department of International Monetary Fund, Nigel Chalk. In some COVID-19 related news now, 14 new COVID-19 positive cases were reported from 269 samples processed on Monday, June 14, 2021, resulting in a positivity rate of 5.2%. 20 new recoveries were noted over the reporting period. 240 cases are currently active and 12 persons with COVID-19 have died. 2,172 cases of COVID-19 and 1,920 recoveries have been recorded in St. Vincent's and the Grenadines since March 2020. The National Emergency Management Organization, NEMO, said persons who persist in incorrect or no mask use remain unvaccinated and participate in mass gatherings will continue to be at a risk for being infected and spreading COVID-19 as is happening now. The public is urged to continue to use masks, sanitize, physically distance and get vaccinated to reduce the spread of COVID-19 in St. Vincent's and the Grenadines gatherings uh, to stem the spread of COVID-19 in the country. At yesterday's news conference, Prime Minister Dr. Afghan Saf said that the protocols for large gatherings have been reviewed and persons can expect to see changes which will be enforced by the police. Either today, I, I believe it might be today, that um, 
there's a new set of public health COVID-19 gathering rules, um, strengthening the framework, the, stat the, the, the statutory framework as to how to deal with some things which persons have not been responsible in containing themselves. Well, we have to strengthen the legislative, the, the regulatory framework with these statutory rules and order which should be coming out and strengthening also the enforcement um, capacity of the police in, in addressing it. But we have to have patience. Prime Minister Gonzalez also maintains that there will be no curfew. We never state an emergency, we never, we never curfew. I hear yesterday the rumor was going around that I was going to impose a curfew. So the person, a person called me and asked me when the curfew started. I said, which curfew are you talking about? They said they hear that I announced a curfew. I said, well, that's news to me, you know. But I just, just take the vaccine, it's available. Prime Minister Dr. Alf Gonsalves is reporting an 8% increase in current revenue for the first five months of the year when compared to the corresponding period last year. According to the Prime Minister, most of the revenue came from stamp duty and aliens' landholding licenses. For the, for the five months, total revenue and grants increased compared to last year from $246.6 million to $286 million, increase of 16%. The current revenue increased by 8.6%, from $242.7 million to $263.7. Now, where a big jump took place, for example, is in stamp duty and alien land holding license. For instance, in the first five months of this year, we collected about $17 million from alien land holding license compared to $2.5 million last year, a jump of 562%. The Prime Minister said that monies also came from the contingency fund and the deficits are better this time around. We move $15 million from the contingency fund into the financing program this, in this first five-month period. So that, that, that provided a further increase in the extent of the revenue, I mean the, 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 the total revenue and grants. Total expenditure went up by almost 2%. As a result, well, capital expenditure went up by about 23%. And we have a current account balance of $6 $6.4 million, $6 million compared to a deficit of $17 million the same period last year and $9 million in 2019. We have an overall deficit about five million, but last year at this time, at the end of May, we had an overall deficit of 35 million. The pattern at the last Freire volcano has been quite similar since uh, the last update on Monday. However, lead monitoring scientist Lloyd Lynch said that there has been an increase in steaming and also a slight increase of seismic activity. Speaking on the Eyeing Lassifer program on NBC Radio this morning, Lynch said that it was observed that there is a periodic burst of a higher level of steaming occurring every half hour. He said that the monitoring team is not sure whether this is a result of the increased level of rainfall stressing the importance of getting the monitoring equipment back up and running soonest. It's important to have some um, improved monitoring at the equator so we can correlate what this um, increase in uh, seismic activity is about and seismic activity as in um, high frequency vibrations mm -hmm. which from experience it looks like theming so we have also 
seeing a slight increase in seismicity, very slight. Uh, on average, our um, we have been recording less than 10 earthquakes uh, over the last 24 hours. There were 11, so slight increase there. Gas monitoring was done yesterday, which showed 352 tons of gas being emitted daily, and which is uh, almost a slight and also a slight increase from the last test. Lynch also noted that now that it is getting deeper into the rainy season, there will be changes in the wind pattern and level of precip precipitation, which can influence what the monitoring team will sense from the volcano. The intensity of the gas that is that a particular area is exposed to in addition with the level of precipitation changing we expect the water table to rise and um, the volcano having hot material still at the top as evidenced by the nasa firm's uh, remote sensing equipment we expect that the water table will interact with the hot material the, and, and, and um, you could have what we call phreatic interaction that if there is sufficient level of um, water interaction and if the, 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 the um, interaction is, is sufficient, uh, we expect that for the interaction, the phreatic explosions, for example, to take place, you need a lot of water to interact sort of suddenly with the hot material. The volcano alert level remains at orange. Assessments have been completed for persons in the red and orange zones, which will determine the amount of monies to be paid out. Speaking at yesterday's news conference, Prime Minister Dr. Al Gansav said that the financial support ranges from $300 to $800. However, he noted that it was observed that the majority of persons displaced are in need of maximum $800. The number of households. Um, 47 households got $300 per house. Are they getting $300 a house? Whole from WFP on the regular basis. 400 per households getting 140. 400 cash, 147 households. 37 households getting $500. 800 households getting $600 and 1,019 households gain $800. $1.7 million has been paid out to our root farmers who are mainly from Fancy to Robica, which is in the red zone. The cleaning of ash in Chatebele and Fitzhughes has commenced by Braxa. These two communities, which are in the orange zone on the leeward side of the island, were not given the all clear to be reoccupied due to the impact by volcanic ash. Prime Minister Dr. Afghan Saf said once the cleaning up exercises are completed, residents can return home. Cleaning up right now in Chatebele. You'll have to go and do. Between this week and next week, they should finish both Chatebele and, and um, Fitus. The part of the problem what we have is that we clean the main roads and the side roads and everything, like in the orange zone. And when people go and do their cleaning and they clean the ash and so on, they put, put it by the side of the road. I told Bragsa, I said, don't complain about that. I don't want to hear no grumbling about that. We just have to go back and do it. You can't wait and people are coming back to do the cleaning, otherwise you wouldn't be able to make any progress. The Prime Minister noted that it is not an easy task cleaning the ash and that more hands and equipment are needed to speed up the process. So if you double back and you have to wash down again, so be it. And it's a long process and more individuals have to be hired, more companies have to be hired to the cleaning and more equipment is also needed. 
and all that is being done. And I'm assured that the, 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 the ash cleaners coming along, they don't, they don't understand. You have to clean the place in stages. Students at the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Community College will now have an easier time preparing soil for the planting of crops as part of their associate degree in agricultural science and entrepreneurship program. The Ministry of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries recently donated to the students uh, uh, Mercuria Bersina RL 408 tiller valued at 10,500 EC dollars. Commenting on the donation, lecturer Mishka Edwards said she welcomed the donation as it is important that the students be exposed to modern practices in agricultural production. In a field such as agriculture, Edwards stressed the importance of hands-on experience, which she sees as beneficial to the development of the student managed enterprises. Chief Agricultural Officer Renato Gums also commi com committed uh, to donating a 1,000-gallon water tank to the college agricultural program. Five omnibus drivers, including two police officers, have been charged with the offense of dangerous driving, which has resulted in the suspension of their driver's license. Head of the Traffic Department, Superintendent Kenneth John, has said the defendant's licenses are suspended pending the outcome of the matters in the magistrate courts. The information was disclosed by head of the traffic department. According to the superintendent, John, about 6 p.m. on Monday, June 14th, traffic officers were conducting motor vehicular checks on public roads. In light of this, motor vehicular H9855, driven by Orvin Trimmingham of Greggs, was spotted at was stopped and it was discovered that the omnibus had more passengers on board than it registered to carry. As a result, Tremingham was issued with a ticket. In the process of issuing the ticket, the driver made use of indecent language. He was informed of the offense and asked to align the vehicle. However, he refused and drove off. As a result, traffic officers pursued and succeeded in bringing the vehicle to a halt. Trimmingham was later arrested and charged with the offense of carrying, of carrying in a public service vehicle more passengers than allowed, making use of indecent language, failing to remain stationary, and assaulting an officer by headbutting him. Trimmingham was taken before the Kingston Magistrate Court yesterday to answer to the charges. He pleaded guilty and he was fined $1,250 with $500 to be paid forthwith and the remainder to be paid by July 31st. In default, he will serve six months in prison.